time to release our kids to the ranch hands and to the buckaroos. Remind everybody again of the horsemanship that's going on and all. This has been a pretty busy week for our young people. A lot of our young people this week have uh, been preparing and taking final exams, going through graduation ceremonies. As they've gone through these ceremonies and all, they've kind of been ready to preparing themselves for the next step in their life. Their life is getting ready to change. Everything that they knew before is going to kind of fall to the back and be a memory. And believe me, there'll be many times that you young people that are going off to college will look back and say, boy, I sure had it good when I was back with mom and dad. I sure, I sure remember all the, the good that was at the house instead of right now you're probably thinking, oh boy, I can't wait to get to college. I can't wait to get out on my own. I can't wait. And you find out you've got to do your own laundry and wash your own drawers and then it all becomes something different, huh? But before we go any farther today, I'd like Lance and Jennifer Baker to come forward. We're going to honor our seniors this, today. We only have one senior this year. And that's not because everybody failed. <laughs> that's because we only have one senior today. Adam, where is Adam at? That's it? He made it. Adam will be moving on. He's going to be moving away and opening up a new chapter in his life. And this is a little token from your youth group leadership to just for you to remember by. It, uh, so how mad can I get? How, how mad can you get? Yeah. None. Okay. <laughs> There's no cash in there. I'm being honest in church at least. <laughs> Yeah, you got two of them. Read it twice as much. I have five of them. Read them five times as much. Okay. <laughs> this cross has the Lord's Prayer on the back of it, and you young eyes you can actually read that. <laughs> you asked me to read the small print. <laughs> 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 yeah. And the soundtrack to the God's Not Dead. Congratulations, young man. Thank you all. You know, as these children prepare, there are children, but they're young people, they're young adults, and they've grown up and they've come to this point in their life where, where things are going to change, and they're opening up a new chapter in their life, and they're going forward as uh, something that they have never seen before and going into the unknown and they have all these hopes and these dreams they're all bright-eyed and stuff and they're getting ready to go and and leave and go into this whole new era this whole new surroundings almost like a whole new world to them but we all have hopes and dreams that we wake up with every morning but things don't always work out the way we dream and the way we plan i guess one of the most unexpected times in america was september 11th People woke up that morning the same as they did every other morning, you know, looking forward to the same things that they were looking forward to. They woke up looking in a way that they were, uh, their lives were normal and secure. They were going to work. They were going to school. They had their, their, their daily things that they were going to do. And then in an instant, a plane hit a tower. And we were unprepared for that as a country. And we were unprepared for that as a people. And our leadership was unprepared for that. I had heard all my life that that would never happen. That there would never be an attack by a foreign nation on U.S. soil. Especially an attack of that magnitude. And it happened. Some of the best laid plans go awry. And with you guys taking all of your final exams... You're going to come out into the world and you're going to go in and you're going to leave this Christian home and this Christian surroundings. You're going to leave your youth group and you're going to go into a world that is a worldly world. 
I will guarantee you, you will run into a professor, a counselor, a college teacher, whatever they call them, that is going to make it his goal to disprove your beliefs. He is going to challenge the foundation in which you've been taught your whole life, or maybe just for the last year. I don't know how long your walk is with Christ. And if you don't have the evidence, if you don't have the background, if you don't have the knowledge of why you believe what you believe, believe me, he's not going to tell you, then you're not going to be able to stand up against this attack. And you know they say that 70% of all Christian men and women that go into the college surroundings fall away from God within the first year. 70% fall away within the first year. You know, those teachers believe what they believe because they've been taught and told that is what to believe. Your teachers believe that. The professors believe that. Other religions believe what they believe because they have been taught and told. So many times if you go to someone and ask him, well, why do you believe that? Why do you feel that way? Why do you say that? You'll find out that they can't answer you. Well, that's just the way it's always been. That's what my mama said. That's what my daddy said. I got into a, a discussion with a young man one time about baptism, and he, he was sprinkled. And I said, you do know the word baptismo means to be immersed and be submerged and be to put under there. He says, I don't care. My mom and dad did that, so it's got to be right. <laughs> we get inbred and embedded with stuff because we're told. You know, there's people might be sitting here today that believe that they're a Christian because that's what they've been told. They've been going to church. They've been a part of it. They've been here, and they think that that is what it is, and they miss the whole part about the relationship, a one-on-one deal with Christ Almighty. So I tell you what I'm going to do today. We're going to take an exam. We're going to have a final exam. Y'all ready for a final exam? Uh, you need a number two pencil? Y'all ain't got to, can we pass out the number two? No, I'm just kidding. We're going to take a final exam here today, all of us, because I believe the lesson that's being taught for our young kids to prepare them to go in the world is something that we can write down and take with us to go into our world each and every day. We're going to be in the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 24. We're going to read verse 44 through 49. You know, there was a time when the disciples' lives were getting ready to change. The world that they were accustomed to. They had been walking with Jesus for three years. They had been in this ministry with him for three years. They had seen his miracles. They were also with his protection and with him and holding on to him. And whenever they had something, they could run right to him just like we do with our parents. That's going to change for our young people. Nowadays, we're going to be a lot closer because you have social media and Facebook and Twitter and Twitter and Instagram and Santa Graham and every other thing they got out there today. I have no idea, but we will be able to, they can talk and communicate and call on cell phones. When I was a kid growing up, there was no cell phone. You know, I could show you all young people a Betamax <laughs> and y'all would want to know what in the world was a Betamax. And that's actually what we used to play our videotapes on when we wanted to watch a movie. And it came in a thing about this big and about that thick. But the box was like, when you had to clear everything off the top of the TV set, that's when TV sets was big as a table. <laughs> Not that I know that for a fact. I've been told that's how it was back then. <laughs> and console TVs. How many of y'all remember console TV? Yeah, man. I thought I'd arrive, buddy, when I got my first console television set. But they're going to have an opportunity to converse and stuff and all. But the disciples were getting ready to, their world was going to change. Jesus was leaving. He was getting ready to ascend. He wasn't going to be right there. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have all this stuff. They didn't have this. All they had was God's Word. And He didn't want to leave them without a few lessons of what they were going to need to get through the rest of their life here on earth. And He did it in a few verses. In Luke 24. And I think if we'll study this, we'll go over it, and we'll take our little quiz on this, and we'll see if we're prepared, or maybe we're at a place in our lives where maybe we need to study a little bit better. Maybe we need to work on this a little better. So we'll go to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to be in verses 44 through 49. Then he told them, 
These, <clears throat> these are many words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understanding the Scripture. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As you stay in the city until you are empowered from the Most High. The first question we're going to talk is going to be on the subject of science. How many of y'all like science? We've got some science majors here. All right, I'm going to give you the question. What evidence proves that the Bible is true? They're going to try to disprove that with science. They're going to tell you that they can show you where things were created a million years ago, that there's a drop of spit in a bucket, and it turned into a little one cell, and that one cell turned into your great, 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 great granddaddy. I say mud. I, get, I, I challenge any of you all to get a bucket of mud and put it on your back porch and leave it there 10 years, and when you come back and tell me what you got on your back porch, I'm betting a bucket of dry dirt. But if you have anything else, let me know. We'll share it to the world together. The verse 44 says that he told them that these are my words that I spoke while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law must be true, must come to truth. The law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, everything must be fulfilled. You know that there was 70 prophecies, 70 prophecies of the coming of the Messiah written at all different times over 1,400 years. All different people wrote these things, and every one of them came true. Is there any way that you could take anything else? When you go to your science teacher and he starts wanting to preach to you about evolution, ask him if he can give you seven statistical facts that are actually, <laughs> she's like, two, seven, oh, two. <laughs> See, I went to school in West Virginia. <laughs> You got you to carry the other one. <laughs> two fingers. I thought she was saying like, two things. Seven facts that they can actually documentate with fact that proves evolution. They can't. I'll bet you would be hard-pressed to give you two that they can actually prove with documented factual stuff. It's all based on theory. All, you know the guy that invented that, uh, that carbon dating? Eventually come back and said it's not very accurate. Before we go any farther, students, I want you to listen to what I'm going to say to you real closely. You're going to enter into a world that's their world. They control that world. And I'm going to tell you exactly the easiest way I know to get an A in every class that you go into, whether it's science or any of these other things that we're going to talk about here, that you'll be able to get an A and it'll never compromise your beliefs. When you go into a science class and a teacher gives you an exam, he's going to give you an exam based on the information that he gave you. Whether it's truth or not, he's going to give you an exam on what information he gave you. If you will take that information, process that information, and give it back to him in the form in which he wants it, whether it be in a test or in a paper or whatever, you will pass that class. You do not have to believe it. Understand? There's going to be no war that you're going to win with your professor. Don't try. But if you'll do these things that we're going to talk about, your presence might change his life. You know that it takes seven things to get an address anywhere in the world. There's only seven pieces of information it takes, and you can send a letter anywhere in the world. Name, address, numbers and stuff. There's seven things that it takes. And I can mail a letter to China or Indonesia or anywhere I want to, which is seven bits of information. The Bible gives us 70 Bits of information that proves that Christ is who he is, that the Bible is true. You want to be able to do it, you can fictional, or factually prove the Bible that it is true. Just by the prophecies that's been fulfilled in it. I'm going to give you the miracle of the four Gospels, written by four different men over a 70-year period in four different locations, all saying the same thing. 
I'm going to tell you right now, I bet you I could go to Harvey and tell him something, and we could whisper it back and forth across the road. And when it got all the way to the back, I went back there and said, tell me what I told you. I'd be like, huh? That ain't what I said. Four men, 70 years, four different locations. We have evidence that the Bible is truth because what it says has been fulfilled. It's happened. It's fact. Even the history teachers state the things in the Bible as fact. How many of y'all remember the Dead Sea Scrolls? They were so excited when they found them. They find them, I was just not even born yet, I don't think, like 70s. All right, I might have been born. (laughs) But they were so happy because they were going to disprove the Bible. What did they do? Prove the Bible. Documented stuff that was written in the Bible. The Bible is a factual, substantiated history book of God Almighty. It is a living, breathing word of God. The next question I'm going to give you. It's on literature. How many of y'all like literature? New. <laughs> what is the one piece of literature that you must read and understand? The Bible. If it's true, if it's factual, if it's your roadmap, if that Bible is the thing that has been given unto you to help you, it comforts you, it encourages you, it strengthens you, it guides you, it directs you, it instructs you gives you everything you need for life to me that would be the one book that we need to read how many of you men out here always read the instructions before you put something together (laughs) yeah (laughs) i was packing (laughs) then you're in the garbage can where are them stupid instructions and I like how we, we phrase it too. It's a, where are the stupid instructions, right? It had nothing to do with the stupid guy that tried to put it together and didn't know what he was doing. The instructions are the stupid ones, right? You know, why would they do that? I don't know. But why when we look at things and we follow instructions, how many of y'all have to follow instructions in school when you're taught in school and you're given guidelines on what you do when, they, when you have to do a paper or you have to do a, uh, 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 an experiment for lab or whatever? you got given boundaries and, pro- and things you have to follow the instructions. Right? How many of y'all play sports? How many of y'all know the rules to your sport? Most people know a lot of them. They might not know all of them. You know, we know all these things, and we're willing to take in all this information, but the one instruction manual that God give us for life is the one that we read the least. The one that we need the most, the one that God's given us to ensure us that we will be on the right page, the right track, headed in the right way, is one piece of literature that we need to study and meditate on and keep. What did it say in verses 44 and 45? The Scriptures said. You know, it goes on to say in the Bible in the New Testament that all Scripture is good for teaching and sound doctrine, doctrine, <coughs> doctrine and encouraging and rebuke. Being able to say why you believe what you believe. Well, why do you believe that? Well, it says right here, I can show you in black and white, unless you want to read the red part, they're pretty powerful and important. I can show you right here. But so many people want to stand on the book. They will contradict you with a book of one author written over a period of 18 months in some room in New York City or California or Colorado, and they'll want to repute the Bible with one book. You know, that was meant up with many authors. Many, many authors over many thousands of years all proclaiming the same thing and all of it coming to be proven and proof. Hey, all of it's proven. Man, what book have you read that can stand on that kind of foundation? What book do you know of? What authority other than you know of than the Bible that has that kind of backing? That's the only book that's 700 years old that everybody can buy and everybody knows about. Any other 700-year-old books, where do you find them at? They're in a museum. And ain't nobody reading them. 
They're treasures. They were written so long ago by this really smart guy. I'm going to tell you what, you can't read a smarter book than that. You can't read a more powerful book than that. You can't be a part of anything more powerful than that. So, our literature that brings us strength and our comfort. How about history? How many of y'all history? I love history, honestly, I do. I like history. I like Texas history, uh, West Virginia history, Florida history. I, lo- I just love finding out about different places in this country. Uh, I mean, if you go to old diner stuff, a lot of time on their placemat, it'll have a history of the building. I always read those things, or the history of the town. I always read those things because it's so cool. It's so neat to know what's going on. What is history for? Why do we study history? To learn, to remember what others have done. Isn't that right? Good or bad, right or wrong, we remember what others have done. Some for us, some against us. We remember 9-11. How many of y'all remember where you were September 11th? Had an impact on you. It's a part of history you'll never forget. There's people that remember the Oklahoma City bombings and where they were. I'll guarantee you those people in Oklahoma City remember it more than anybody because it had a direct impact on them. How many of y'all served in Vietnam? How many of y'all served in Afghanistan? How many military people we have that served overseas? Any, anytime, anywhere overseas. Those places have a special impact in your life because it has a personal connection to you. It's a part of history that we read in a book and we put a blanket on it. But to you guys, it's powerful. It carries memories. Some good, so many not so good. You want a part of history? I'm going to give you a history. There was a God that loved the world so much that he sent his only son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You want a part of history? God's son died on that cross. What more in history do we need? You want to study something, folks? I'm telling you, young people, if you'll remember these things, if you'll remember your Bible, if you'll remember that God's Word is true, it's been proven to be true over hundreds of years it's been proven to be true. It's documented and substantiated as a true book. If you will read that book, gosh, I can't encourage everybody in here enough to read that book and remember our history that once I was lost, but now I'm saved. If we will remember the fact that Jesus came and died, what a most powerful point of, uh, of history that took place for so many so long ago. But for those of us that have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, it's that personal, just as much as that man that was in Afghanistan or that lady that was in Iraq that soldier that was in Vietnam or World War II. It should have that personal connection, that personal impact, that personal, man, I remember when. How many of y'all remember the day that you come to know the Lord? That's a part of history that changed the world. You know that? You know how many wars have been fought over Christ? You know how many people have fought and died over the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ? You want to know how much history was put in history books over one Savior, one man? But I remember him because I had that personal connection. One-on-one. It's a part of history in my life that I never want to forget. It's why we do the Lord's Supper. We do it why? In remembrance of me. What do we remember? The broken body and the shed blood. That was done for why? It was done for many. It was done for us. Well, you want some personal history in your life? Wrap your arms around that. Wrap your arms around the history that a God so loved you so much. Paul said that even while we were yet sinners, while we were yet separated, while we were yet far away from God, he says, I don't care. I still love you. And I want you to know me. I'm going to give you the choice. 
Wow, what a most powerful part of history. You know what? You won't find it in any history book in your college that you're getting ready to go to. You have not been taught it in any history book in your high school. Unless you went to a private Christian school, I'm sure it wasn't taught to you at all under the title of a public school. But it's the most powerful part of history ever. It changed the world. It changed the whole world. What an impact. Well, I told you I went to school in West Virginia, right? So when we get talking about the grammar part, don't hold it against me. There's a word that was in our scripture that was used in the grammar. The grammar is a way of communication, proper communication. The word was preach. We are all called to be preachers, but yet we think it's only the man up here on Sunday. Everybody is called to spread the gospel. You say, well, preacher, I don't know enough. I ain't studied enough for this exam. I'm not prepared enough. I'm going to give you the best way in the world to preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talked about it on Wednesday night with our youth group. Act, witness through acting through your actions i tell you what when you get in college and you got that that history teacher that wants to beat you up over your beliefs put some love on him and just keep loving him he won't know how to act he wants you to retaliate he wants you to fire off he wants you to act as the world acts you can pr proclaim and preach the gospel by not saying a word isn't that awesome that you can actually reach out to people and touch people's lives and change people's lives by them just seeing the change in your life. How many of y'all know that guy as soon as you start talking about Jesus, his ears go shut? Shoot, I know a hundred of them. They get that deer in the headlight look, oh Lord, not again. <laughs> Is he ever going to shut up? But when they watch your actions... They can't ignore them. And I'm going to tell you what. Where there's peace and love, everybody wants to be. I don't care who they are. They want a part of that. I want some of that. Where'd you get that at? Down to Cowboy Church. How much it cost? They've given it away. Free. This guy named Jesus paid for it on a cross. It's all yours. Come on down and get some. They're willing to listen to that. Put power in your words. I was talking with a gentleman the other day that he was talking about one of the hardest things that he has to do is his speech as he grows in Christ and stuff and all. And he gets back in those circles that his language is the hardest thing to overcome. But as he works on it, I've been there. How many of y'all work in an oil field or a factory or out where there's just cursing is like the normal language? I mean, it's just, you know. They don't mean anything by it. It's just a way of communication. We, we've talked about this before. That's their normal communication. They don't even realize they're doing it. But I tell you what, when they start seeing you change, when they start seeing you proclaim the gospel through your act and through your living, when they start seeing you preach Jesus because you got power in what you say because they watch how you live. And when they watch how you live, they say, you know what? He believes what he's saying. And wow. I've seen the change. Maybe that could happen to me. I've said this a million times. If you go back to my high school and told them that I was preaching in a cowboy church in Glen Rose, Texas, they'd fall off their bar stool. <laughs> Believe me, if you went back and found my friends, that's where you'd find them. Matter of fact, I think they're sitting on the same bar stool that they were sitting on when I left 35 years ago. But actions change people. How does he deal with that? How can he be so calm? Some of y'all, Terry and I got into a new business venture, and we're working in a new job. It's her old job and my new job. And, 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 and as a pastor, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm the worrier in the family. You know, and she's like, you know, I'm there wondering, you know, how's this all going to work out? And her and the boss are like, would you all just calm down? Just, for, just relax? God's got this. And I'm like, can't you all see the importance of this right now? I understand God's got it, but he needs my help. <laughs> Why y'all laughing? You're right, God doesn't need my help. 
He needs my obedience. He needs me to live that life out. And when I do that, you know that? You're proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ every day when people see you do that. You know and then we get to speak out, and they see you live a certain way, and that man says something in front of you, and you say, pardon me, sir, I'd appreciate it if you didn't use that kind of language. Instead of getting a retaliation from that man, when he sees you live it and believe it, what you'll get from him is, man, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Two weeks later, he'll slip up again, and you'll get this out of him. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I didn't see you standing there. Oh, I forgot. You didn't beat him over the head about his cussing. You didn't proclaim him that Jesus is going to send you to hell because you crushed like a drunken sailor. You just lived a life in front of him that preached the gospel to him in a way that it changed his life that he automatically started respecting it. And he didn't even know why. <coughs> then the next thing you know, he starts talking to you a little bit. And he starts asking you a little question. And the next thing you know, you're sitting around a table with this guy that you thought was the biggest heathen in the world. And he's asking you about Jesus. And you're wondering, I've had people say this to me, I didn't even know I had that effect on us. I didn't know that young man here that we talked about that got baptized not too long ago that kind of shocked Glen Rose. The gentleman that got to baptize him was a boss of his. And he had such a pronounced effect on this young man that he asked him to be the one to baptize him. And when I was talking with Ben, Ben's like, I, I, I didn't know that I had that kind of effect on he didn't preach to him. He didn't hammer him over his head. He lived a good Christian life in front of him to at the point in that young man's life when it got so broken and so down and he knew he needed something. He says, I want that. <clears throat> Folks, that's a grammar lesson without saying a word. It's a grammar lesson of preaching God and, and proclaiming God and not saying a word. And then it opens up to that time that you can preach. And you say, well, I'm not a preacher. The Bible says don't worry about what you're going to say. If you'll go in my name, God's promise to you is if you'll go in my name, you just walk up to the plate. I'll hit the home run. I ain't never hit a home run in my life. You walk up to the plate with God behind you. You'll swing that bat. You got a loaded bat. Last thing we're going to talk about, last question on the quiz. If the key word's preaching, the next word's going to be where, our geography lesson. We looked at verse 47, he said, repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations beginning with Jerusalem. Let me encourage each and every one of you young people as you go off to college, if you get the opportunity or try to make the opportunity to take one summer and spend it in mission somewhere. Understand this, that the mission field is not all overseas. Billy Graham said the greatest mission field in America today is the church pews. There's as many lost people in church as there are saved people in church. Believe me, there's as many lost people in Glen Rose. There's as many lost people in this state of Texas, in the United States, you can mission right here. But if God's calling you to go somewhere, go there. Do it one summer. Take a summer and do a mission. But all of us that have jobs and we just can't get on a plane and go somewhere or, or head out at the drop of a hat like the Texas Baptist men do when a disaster is, I want you to know that that says right here, first in Jerusalem. That meant first in your own backyard. First at home. You ever heard everybody say you need to clean up your own mess before you start worrying about somebody else's? I'm going to tell you what, we got some messy people in Glen Rose. We got them in Granbury. We got them all over the state of Texas. You don't have to go far. Folks, we can be on a mission field in our everyday lives every day. Pick one person in your life and say, you know what? That's going to be my mission. That person's going to be my mission. I'm going to work on that one person. I'm not going to beat them over the head. I'm not going to hog time, put three wraps and a hooey on them, drag them behind the horse to church. I'm going to live a life in front of them that would honor God, that they hear the gospel without me saying a word. I don't have to stick a fish on the back of my car. The geography is here. I'll bet you everyone here, if I asked you privately, 
could give me five quick names of people that you know that need Jesus Christ. Just that quick, you could give me five. You could give me a need. You could give me another five people that are in need, need of something, an elderly, a a, a family that's in trouble. You could give me five names of people in need. So if we take this exam and we do those five things, if we, we answer and work on those five questions, if we can handle those five questions, you know what? There's nothing that can take us by surprise. Now, will it catch us off guard? Absolutely. Will it knock us sideways? Very possible. Will it knock you down? I fell off more horses than I've ridden, I reckon. But you just get back up and get back on. But see, the strength for this, to fight the battle, the strength for this, to live the life of Christ, to be able to preach that unspoken word, the strength in all is going to come from these five things. One is that we realize in our hearts that God's word is a proven, proven fact. It is real. It is not just a book. The other one's going to be that we read it that we keep it, that we study it. Like our favorite, I don't know what your favorite uh, uh, subject is in school. Mine was recess. <laughs> Lunch was a good one. That was my second favorite, as you can see. That was your first. <laughs> this should be our favorite subject, our Bible. Read it and study it and know it. The Bible says that all Scripture is great for reproof. It's also great for teaching and learning and encouraging, lifting up and edifying, comforting, healing. Maybe someone came here today that, that's got something in their heart that they need healed. It's right here. The remedy's right here. The cure's right here. That's just a book preacher broken by a bunch of old guys a long time ago. Yep. You're absolutely right. And all the prophecies have been proven, documented, done. Folks, if we're going to pass our final exam, we need to take these five things. We need to remember our history, our Savior that died for us. We need to remember that the mission field is around us every day. But most of all, remember that you're never alone. The greatest words that Jesus left with his disciples when he left, when he finally ascended. Lo, I am with you, even unto the end of the age. Whatever valley you go through, every mountain you cross, every ditch you've been in, God's been there with you. Dear Lord, we just love you, and we thank you, and we praise you. Lord, as we study this final exam, it's, it's so easy for us to, to forget that one book we hear so many of different books and different things and different sayings and and we get intrigued and encouraged and drawn away from the truth the best part about your book is it's true cover to cover there's no maybes what is or lies it's truth father may we read it and keep it may we be able to live that life that preaches your gospel May we have the courage to speak when it comes that time. May we have the strength to stand firm. And Lord, may we seek the mission field that's in our own backyard. Father, what an exam. It's a tough one. Not one of those things are easy. But the best part about it is you'll study right with us. And if we fail, we can take it over. God, I don't know the hearts of those that have come here today. I don't know if they have a relationship with you or not. But maybe during taking this exam, they realize that that there's a, a God out there that sent a son to die for them. That they don't have to have this worldly vision. They don't have to keep searching and wondering that they've now found a place where they can find the truth. And today, they'd like to have that truth. Lord, your word teaches us that they'll believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord. Your word tells us that if they believe that You raised him from the dead, Almighty God, that they shall be saved. That whosoever calls on the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. No matter what they've done, no matter how far they've been, no matter what books they've read, what, what history lessons they've studied, what, what a past they have, Father, today could be the turning point. Today they could take their final exam. Today they could secure their eternity with you. And it comes to a simple prayer. Lord, I just pray that they'd pray along with me today, that they would just say, Lord, I've realized now, after going through this exam, understanding about your word being so true, understanding about a Savior that loved me so much, I've come to that point where I need you into my life. I believe now that Jesus was you in the flesh. I believe that he walked this earth to be my guide. I believe that he died on a cross for me, that he paid a debt I could never pay. And I know in my heart that he was raised from the dead. Father, that he now sits at your right hand. And it's through him I call on you. I ask you to come in and be the Lord and master of my life. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. If you said that prayer, would you please fill out a green sheet? Not going to hound you, just want to rejoice with you. We want to be able to celebrate with you, maybe get you started with some discipleship. Uh, before we go, I'm going to go ahead and bless the food back here for everybody to eat. Please stay and eat and enjoy the horsemanship class. We've got plenty of chairs out there. I don't know how hot it is, but we've got some shade. Uh, we'll do the best we can to keep you cool. Let's bless the food. Father God, we just thank you for this word and this, and this church. Lord, we thank you so much for all those that have come here today. Father, we just you're the reason why we are here. You're the reason why we celebrate. Father, we just want to lift you up and know that you know how much we thank you and how much we love you. Lord, thank you for forgiving us where we fail you, for continually loving us. We ask now that you would bless this food to our bodies, that you would strengthen us and nourish us with it, that we may serve.